finding the rate law experimentally. In this video, we're going to be identifying ways that the reactant or the product can be monitored in order to measure their change over time. We'll then explain using collision theory why the rate law may still not be what is expected from the reaction mechanism. And then we'll finally get to using experimental data to determine the real actual rate law for an experiment. Now, we're not going to be covering this, but keep in mind that using the material that we do in this video, along with the material that we did in the mechanism video, you should be able to tell if something is consistent with its mechanism. In other words, does the rate law you derive from the mechanism match up with the rate law that we determine from the experiment? So before we talked about many things that matter when it comes to the rate law, for instance, orientation, we said that sometimes even with a mechanism, you can't tell the experimental rate law, or you can't determine the experimental rate law for sure, because things such as orientation could cause you to need more reactant than one might expect. So this comes into play along with all of the other things we've already discussed when we're talking about activation energy. And we'll get to that near the end of this video. So the only true way to find the rate law is what we'll finally be doing today, which is experimentally. So there's many different ways that we can measure how much of a given substance we have. And we need to use that to find the rate law for the various substances. So pick the ones that you can measure. For instance, some absorb light. And we can use a spectrophotometer. Here I pictured a really, really old one for nostalgia value. But there's a lot of different new ones that are out that do a really great job. Now, we can think of absorbing light as being colored. Our eyes would see something absorbing light as being colored. But there's lots of things that absorb in regions that we can't see. And so those are clear to us. But a spectrophotometer would be able to see that. It would be able to tell you exactly how much of the UV or IR light is absorbed. So you could use that to measure very specific concentrations. Here I showed bromine just because we can see it with the naked eye as well. But this the spectrometer would be able to see it more specifically and be able to relate numbers to it. Now, another thing that you can do is related to gaseous product. So for instance, think back to when we talked about gases, um, perhaps even in a different class, and we had an experimental setup where a reaction was happening, and then we were collecting gas in a different container over water. And we had several different things we had to do. We had to measure P and V and T. And then we use that with our knowledge of vapor pressure to solve a problem that allowed us to solve for n. I'm not going to do that entire problem here, as this is just not a section on that. But we can do this. There's also far more accurate ways of measuring the amount of gaseous species that come off that we could use, and several other ways of doing this. And so it effectively becomes just measure whatever you can. These are two that I talked about specifically because you can picture them without knowing a huge amount of analytical science. But when you get further into analytical chemistry and instrumental analysis, you'll learn there's lots of ways that we can talk about different species and how to measure them. So now, once you have the, the materials that you can measure, now you want to think about how you actually want to set up your experiment. In each case, we want to know how one concentration of one reactant affects the rate. And so it works best if we hold just one constant or rather all of them constant, and we only change one. And then once we do that, we switch. And once we switch, we can get the opposite. And we can do this with as many reactants as we have in order to solve for each one individually. Now, once you do this and you collect all the data, you can look at the problem, which we're going to do shortly, and you can decide what is the exponent on each of these rate laws. And we've so far only been talking about them in terms of whole numbers, but they could also be partial, or they could be fractions. Um, and things like that will occur, and you, you can calculate them. And you'll have two examples in this video, and then you'll have several homework examples. So let's look at this one. Here I've already set the data up for you. We have a reaction of A plus B goes to products. Use the following data to calculate the rate law and the rate con constant. So in each case, I'm showing you the concentration of the initial species, and I'm showing you the rate of the reaction that comes off from that. Now, if you look at where I put the stars, you can see that in each case, we have something being held constant. So in the first two stars, in the trial one and trial two, you can see that we're holding a constant. But 
in trial one and trial three, if you just compare those two, we're holding B constant. So using this, we can look at the rate law as a very general format. Rate equals k, a to the x, b to the y. And we can look, set up a ratio to determine what each of these are. So I'm effectively going to take one of these equations and put it over top of another one. So if you look at this, the only thing that has changed is I now have two of them. One is straight over top of the other one. And in each case, I have a subscript marking whether they're trial one or trial two, or just any one trial and any other trial. It doesn't actually matter which is which. So now let's look at what happens if I hold B constant. B would be the same number. K is going to be the same number, and that would cancel out. And so we end up with R1 over R2 equals the concentration of A1 over the concentration of A2 to some power. And we have all of those values except x, and so we can solve for that. Now, the same thing will happen if we hold A constant. Only now, k and a will cancel out. And this will leave us with r1 over r2 equals b1 over b2 raised to the power of y. Once again, we know all of our numbers, and so the only thing that we're left with is y. So let's go ahead and do this on the next slide with real numbers. So I'm going to just take the bottom two equations, transfer them to the next slide, and we'll work from there. So let's, take, let's first look and see which trials we want to use for this first one. For this first one, I have A, which means that B needs to be held constant. Otherwise, we're going to be changing multiple things. And so when we look at this and we fill in our numbers, we fill in our numbers from our first and third trials. So we fill our rates in to one and our concentrations into the other. From here, we can solve for our number. And you'll see we have 2 equals 2 to the x. Now, we have to think about this and decide what does that mean about x. It has to mean that x is equal to 1. So now we can do the same thing for the next one. And we can put our rates over top of each other. Now in this case, we're comparing B. And so we need to hold A constant. And so we're using our first and second trial. Now in this case, you can see that even though our rates stayed the same, our concentrations changed. So we can take a number here, but this is going to be true pretty much for all of these sorts of cases, where our rate doesn't change, but our concentration does. That, what that actually means is that our rates are not dependent on our concentration because changing them doesn't make a difference. And so that has to mean, if you want to look at it in mathematical terms, that y is equal to 0. Though if you want to look at it in conceptual terms, you can just say, well, that means that that will never factor into the equation, that b just doesn't come up in the rate law at all. So now that we have these exponents, we can do something that we weren't able to do before. We're able to actually solve for k. Instead of just leaving it as a constant, it's much better if we can actually solve for a number here. So if we look at our rate law, and now we can actually go ahead and say that b to the 0th power, since that's just going to equal 1 and doesn't actually factor into rate at all, can just become r equals k times the concentration of a. And we can use this to solve for k. Now, if you were doing this reaction for real, you would probably want to do this for all three trials, or however many trials you have, and then average the results. There would be experimental error. There would be you know, some randomness to the situation. Now, in this case, um, it's fabricated data. The data is 100% perfect. And so we can just pick any trial, and every single one will lead to the exact same result. And so in this case, I picked the first one. And so we can go ahead and plug in our rate over top of our concentration. And you can see that this also gives us our units right in there as well. And we get our number. Once we have that number, we can plug that back into the rate law for k to write out our final rate law of r equals 0.21 inverse molar concentration of a. So in review, we have the fact that products and or reactants, sometimes both, sometimes just one, can be monitored by looking at a variety of different things. For instance, whether they absorb light, or how much gas is made, or a variety of instrumental techniques that we are not going to cover in this class.
So due to several different factors, whether it be orientation or activation energy or a variety of things, sometimes the mechanisms still don't fully explain the reaction rate. And so to do this, we have to, and adjust for this, we have to run the actual reaction. And we will do this several times at varying concentrations, each time holding one of the reactants constant to be able to solve for a final reaction mechanism that has the proper exponents and the proper K. Okay. 